Hi, everyone. Hello. I am Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark, dark. dark. Missing and Unsolved. This is a Palma Hulk Media production covering true crime, missing people, unsolved crime, and cold cases. Please check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, and links to all of our social medias. On the website, we also have a virtual tip jar, so you can leave us a tip and we'll give you a shout out on the show. Another way to support this show is to join our Pomahawk Media Patreon. On Patreon, you'll receive early and ad-free episodes for all of our Pomahawk Media shows. And depending on what tier you choose, bonus content and special gifts from us might come right to you. Yes, and you can find our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Pomahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. There's also going to be a link in the show notes. So, Lauren. So, Ken. Uh, before we start tonight, I really, we just got back from CrimeCon. I know it's been a couple of weeks now, but I just I really want to say thank you to everyone that we got a chance to meet and converse with at CrimeCon. Uh, we spoke to so many people and it was amazing. This CrimeCon was amazing. We were in Florida, we were in Orlando, and we spoke to so many people and just had a great time. Um, if you're a patron, then you, you, you've already heard me go on about this. But there's two things, two things, two, or I should say two people I want to give a shout out to. One, Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber. If you're in South Florida and you need a plumber, look up Joe the Plumber. And by the way, (laughs) you owe us like 12 bucks for the Tootsie Rolls, dude. Seriously. But no, seriously. And then there's another gentleman who, if you are a patron, you've listened to our latest episode of Off Topic Uncut, which was talking all about suicide. And it was, I mean, that was like the longest off topic uncut I think we've ever done. Yeah, because that was I a pretty was, long one. If you are the gentleman that came up to me and asked me the question of how many people do you think go missing who mean to go missing, please find us on social media. You know who you are. You came back to the table a couple different times. We talked about the board and you asked me that question. And you, like I talked about on our Patreon episode, You rented space in my head for like forever. Uh, We to the point where I told Lauren, look, we have to cover this because I got to get this off my brain. Let's put it on. Let's put it on tape, so to speak, and get this off my brain. So if you're that guy, please, you came over, you stood there and you spoke with me a little bit. We talked about it and you asked me how many people go missing on purpose. And I said 1%. And you said 1%, that's all? Well, I on our Patreon episode, I really – Dove right into that and discussed exactly why I thought it was 1%. And then we gave some, we, we, I think it was a great episode. It came out really good. It's a little over like an hour and a half long, but it was about pseudo side. And if, if you guys are patrons, then you know, if not, feel free to shoot on over there, sign up. It's available. It's a great episode. And if you are the guy that gave me the inspiration for the episode, please hit us up on social media. I really want to discuss that topic further. So with that being said, we hope that if we didn't get to see you at this crime con, we really want to see you in Nashville. It's it's an amazing event. That's kind of all I want to say. I just want to get that off my chest, Lauren, because I had such a great time. I'm still feeling the energy off of it. It was amazing. So yeah, it was it was a great crime con. So, but we have a case tonight. Yes, we have a case, an old and cold case of the two Marys, Mary Opitz and Mary Hare, a teenager named Mary parked at the local mall and was never seen again. Another teenager named Mary disappeared from the same parking lot at the same mall less than a month later, and her murdered body was found a few months later. There's so many similarities between the girls, it's hard to believe they didn't know each other. Did they suffer the same fate? Could the cases be connected? Was it the work of a serial killer or just a super eerie coincidence? Will solving one murder lead to the truth in the other? This is the cold case of Mary Hare and Mary Opitz. Sharing both their stories together may help bring out details in their cases that help find answers. And answers are what we're looking for. One has a known fate, stabbed in the back and discarded in the field. The other is a complete mystery. What happened to her is limited only to our imagination. From pictures, it's hard to tell Mary Hare and Mary Opitz apart. Both had wavy brown hair parted in the middle in grainy 1970s style photos. If you heard them talk, they'd even sound similar. Both girls grew up in New York and still had 
New York accents, even though they were both now in Florida. They went to the same high school, were good students, and had stable lives. They didn't get in trouble at home or at school, and they were running errands on their last known days alive. They may have even crossed paths at some point before their fates were connected, without even realizing it. And Mary Opitz worked at Mariner's Inn, and Mary Hare sometimes went there with her friends. Both their stories ended in 1981 in Fort Myers, Florida, in the parking lot of the Edison Mall, which is still around today. Their last known moments were in a well-lit parking lot at the same local mall, but there are very few clues. To set the time and place for this cold case and maybe jog someone's memory, the Edison Mall opened in Fort Myers, Florida in 1965 and has been expanded three times since. The food court was added in 1981, the same year the girls disappeared. The mall is named for inventor Thomas Edison because he has a connection to the area. He actually spent his winters at a residence and laboratory in Fort Myers. Edison isn't the only person to visit the area seasonally. Fort Myers is a gateway to Southwest Florida and a major tourist destination, especially during the winter months when these crimes occurred. The Edison Mall was built on a former strawberry field in the northeast corner of Route 41 and Colonial Boulevard on the south side of Fort Myers. Back then, the highway was only two lanes wide and the only other businesses in the area were a supermarket and a drive-in movie theater. For Mary Opitz, the fateful trip to the mall was January 16, 1981. The 17-year-old went to the mall with her mother, Nancy Hoffman, and her younger brother around 6.30 p.m. And in 2017, her mother told Dateline, On our way out, I had run into someone I knew, and we were talking. Mary didn't want to wait and said she'd meet us at the car. Her brother stayed with me. There was no reason to be scared or suspicious. Mary bought a package of pretzels and went out to the car, a Burgundy 1979 Chevrolet Camaro. When Mary's family got to the car near the Woolworth store, they found the pretzels and the purchases on the trunk of the car, but Hoffman's daughter was gone. Well, Mary's family didn't really panic at first as they began like looking around for her at the mall, checking to see if she'd run into some friends or she'd run back inside the mall to use the restroom. They began asking all the people coming in and out of the mall if they had seen her. And when all these efforts didn't pan out, the family quickly went to the police to report her missing. But it wasn't until another teenage girl vanished from the same parking lot that police started to take things seriously. 18-year-old Mary Elizabeth Hare went to the Edison Mall to pick up her mother from work around 8.30 p.m. and disappeared on February 11, 1981. Now remember, Mary Opitz had just disappeared in January. Her 1973 green Buick LeSabre was found unlocked in the parking lot near Woolworth. In June of 1981, an elderly couple looking for stones for their garden found Mary Hare's fully clothed but badly decomposed body in a field near Alabama Road and Highway 82 in a remote, undeveloped area of Lehigh Acres, Florida, not far from Fort Myers. She was a victim of a homicide. She had been stabbed twice in the back. There's reason to think that whoever killed one Mary may be responsible for the disappearance of the other. Now, law enforcement originally believed Mary Opitz had run away, claiming she was a teenager and probably went out to hang with her friends. Now, this this is so frustrating, Lauren. I mean, I know that oftentimes children run off to hang with friends or they will get angry and run away. I mean, they literally had just walked out of the mall. She would not leave her new stuff that she had just purchased and her food that she purchased uneaten, just leave that there if she was going to take off, especially when, according to Mary's mother, Mary had a lot to look forward to and she would not have just run away. I mean, she was about to get her braces off. She was saving money for a car. She was studying to get her GED. I mean, she literally had no reason to run away. Plus, Mary did not even have her purse with her. 
let alone any clothing or personal items that you would expect that someone that's going to take off running away from the family would take with them. And she also had like $300 left in her bank account. Why would you take off and leave that? I don't know. And $300 in 1981 was a lot of money. Exactly. You're not taking, you're not taking off and leaving that there. Almost a month later, Nancy went to the Lee County Sheriff's Office instead of the Fort Myers Police and found officers had never put Mary Opitz on the missing children's list. They lost almost a month's time when no one in law enforcement was looking for Mary Opitz. Whether the delays made a difference, it's hard to know. The second girl going missing and later found dead must have impacted the family. They must have feared that the same thing happened to their daughter, but the evidence hasn't turned up. Well, you know, what they say, the first 48 hours right. is usually the most important. So if it took a month for this to occur, then people weren't notified. They weren't on notice. You know, so I guess the, the pro, maybe the protocols back in the 80s were a little different. Well, I think it's just the same that we still see today when a teenager is reported missing. A lot of sheriff's office or police departments want to say, oh, there's a runaway. Wait 24 or 48, 72 hours and, you know, they'll probably yeah. come back on their own. That's so frustrating. But both girls could have been victims of suspected serial killer Christopher Wilder. Now, Wilder was accused of sexually assaulting and murdering more than a dozen women in Florida and several other states during the early 1980s. He was known to try and lure victims with offers of non-existing modeling jobs or sessions. He was killed during a shootout with police in 1984 after a six-week crime spree, and we're going to talk about him later, but let's take a quick break. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. And I am Ken. And you may recognize our voices from the podcast Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Missing and Unsolved. But today we're here to tell you about a nonprofit organization we have created called the Florida Themis Project. Themis is the Greek goddess of justice, if you're wondering about the name. The Florida Themis Project aims to support loved ones and victims of unsolved crime by financially contributing to various types of investigative tools, including DNA testing. We also help the families and loved ones of missing people by assisting with awareness campaigns, helping in ground searches, and any other assistance that we can provide to the families. We're asking you for your help to spread the word and grow our organization so we can help as many people as possible. So please be sure to check out our website at floridathemisproject.org for info about how you can help or donate. We're also on Facebook and Instagram at Florida Themis Project. Even simply sharing our post on social media is very helpful. So thank you in advance, true crime friends, for your help and support. Okay, so we're back. Well, like we were talking about before, the, the police just kind of were lackadaisical about the whole Hey, your kid's missing. We get it. So finally, we get to this point. The investigators no longer believe that Mary left on her own. Now, her disappearance is classified as a non-family abduction, and she is presumed to have been taken by someone she didn't even know. The two Marys were not the only women to come to harm at the Edison Mall. Now, that's not to say we're blaming the Edison Mall for any of this. It just happened to be a location. Now, 1978, three women were abducted from the Edison Mall and taken to a wooded area by Pine Island, by a man with a knife. They were all robbed, tied up, only to be found later. A man named John Warren Edding of Canton, Illinois, was later arrested when he returned to the mall in a stolen car. Now, he was convicted of the crimes and sentenced to 90 years in prison. But in December of 1980, Edding escaped from prison and abducted two doctors on different occasions. This is horrifying. He escaped, and then he abducts two more people. So, obviously, prison's not working for him. I know. Because it's not – I mean, you're supposed to get better. It's not working. Well, he took an emergency room doctor hostage in Gainesville, then abducted a female doctor who worked at the same hospital and held her for 18 hours before releasing her in Tallahassee. Fortunately, these two doctors were not harmed physically. In the wake of the two young women's disappearance – there were many rumors going around Fort Myers, and residents were nervous. 
Some said that dismembered bodies of young women had been found. Another rumor was that a teenage girl had been dragged out of the Edison Mall by two men dressed as women. But Fort Myers Police Captain Elvin R. Washburn told the Fort Myers News Press that the rumors were unfounded. That still didn't calm the Fort Myers residents. Authorities tried to find any connection between the abduction of the two Marys and four similar unsolved abductions in the Tampa area, also in southwest Florida, between November 1979 and September of 1980. Sharon Herrer, 20, disappeared on November 26, 1978 from the parking lot of an after-hours club in St. Petersburg. Sandra Jean Graham, 21, disappeared from a parking lot at a lounge in West Tampa on April 27, 1980. Melinda Harder, 21, vanished while walking into a convenience store in St. Petersburg on July 27, 1980. And Elizabeth Margaret Graham disappeared in Largo, Florida on September 9, 1980, when she answered an ad looking for someone to groom a poodle. No connection was ever made between the Tampa cases and the two Marys in Fort Myers, though. Yeah, and they're not too far apart. I mean, it's it's feasible to be within two hours from Fort Myers into Tampa. Right, yeah. So when you look at a map, it seems far, but I mean, it's literally someone could drive to Fort Myers, do harm, and then go right back in Tampa, which right. looking into it makes sense if someone was going to do that to abduct them to go to an odd city or a town close by where, you know, you could grab someone and get back to your city or do harm to someone and then return less likely in the eighties to be found that way, particularly 1980. Here's an odd thing, Lauren, 14 months after Mary Opitz vanished, her mother, Nancy watching TV, noticed an image flash across the TV screen during a documentary about Puerto Rico. There was a clip of this girl walking down the street in San Juan. And she looked so much like Mary that investigators asked the Puerto Rican police to look for her. Now, Lieutenant Tom Wallace of the Lee County Sheriff's Office watched this clip over and over and over for hours. And he told the Fort Myers News Press that there were undeniable similarities between uh, the girl in the video and Mary Opitz. So they actually sent people down there and they contacted them and they tried to find this girl and – but nothing was ever found in Puerto Rico. So obviously this was not the girl. We're not sure how that turned out, but they did actually go down there and do some investigation to see if in fact Mary was there. Well, almost four years after Mary Opitz disappeared, the investigators were no closer to finding her. Many said it was more difficult because there was no real crime scene or witnesses But they now solidly believe that the disappearance of Mary Opitz and the murder of Mary Hare were related. And the most widely accepted theory is that they were both victims of serial killer Christopher Wilder, who we mentioned earlier. Christopher Bernard Wilder, a.k.a. the Beauty Queen Killer, was a serial killer who abducted and raped at least 12 young women and girls, torturing and killing at least eight of them in 1984. On February 26, 1984, Wilder embarked on a seven-week-long cross-country trip during which he murdered at least eight women, all aspiring models. Now, this earned him the ominous moniker of the Beauty Queen Killer. His rampage began in Florida and continued across the country through Texas, Oklahoma, Nevada, California, New York, before he committed suicide during a struggle with police in New Hampshire on April 13, 1984. Now, this was just the tail end of Wilder's violent life. Wilder, born on March 13, 1945, in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, to an American father, a naval officer, and Australian mother. When he was 17, Wilder participated in the gang rape of a 13-year-old girl on a Sydney beach. He pled guilty but only received a year of probation and mandatory psychiatric counseling. He later claimed they used shock therapy on him during his therapy, but there's no evidence of this. At age 23, Wilder married, and his wife left him less than a week later, accusing him of sexual abuse and claiming that he had tried to kill her. There's a big surprise. In 1969, 24-year-old Wilder moved to Boynton Beach, Florida, where he made millions in 
the construction and real estate business. He lived a life of luxury and fast cars, literally. He became a semi-professional race car driver. Between 1971 and 1975, he was in and out of court facing various charges related to sexual misconduct. He eventually developed an interest in photography and purchased many expensive cameras. He converted a bedroom in his home into a dark room. Attached to it was another secret room he used to develop photographs he took of his sex crimes. It's those little rooms that make you so skeeved out. Yes. In 1974, Wilder raped a young woman he had lured into his vehicle on the pretense of photographing her for a modeling contract. This would become part of his modus operandi during his later rape and murder spree. A plea bargain got him probation and more psychiatric care. In 1977, a psychologist deemed him unsafe except in a structured environment and noted his need to dominate women and his desire to turn them into slaves for his pleasure. Wilder had expressed interest in white slavery and spoke of his sexual fantasies which involved twisting women's nipples during sex and slapping and kicking his sexual partners. That is an awful human being. Yes, totally creepy and gross and scary. Exactly. You know, and despite his crimes and convictions, Lauren, he was never sentenced to any prison time. Basically. Slap on the wrist. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And many theorize that because he seemed to get away with his crimes with little to no penalty, it kind of just it made him more dangerous. Right. So more of a dangerous individual because he's getting more confident with each crime. Exactly. There's no consequences or repercussions. So therefore he's like, oh, well, I'm untouchable. Now it wasn't until 1982 while visiting his parents in Sydney when Wilder abducted two 15 year old girls, forced them to get naked and took pornographic photos of them. And he was finally arrested and charged with kidnapping and sexual assault. So there's a little bit of something happening to actually punish this guy, but. You know how it goes. He was released on bond while he awaited trial, and he fled back to the U.S. So additionally, two other young girls, aged 10 and 12, later identified Wilder from mugshots as the man who had abducted them in Boynton Beach, Florida, in 1983 and forced them to perform oral sex on him. Oh, my God. This what a monster. He's a monster. Exactly. That was the exact term I was thinking, Lauren. Let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll come back and finish this up. Okay, and we're back. So, Christopher Wilder's MO was to meet young girls and women in places like malls, casting calls, beauty pageants, and other events. He would tell them he was a photographer and say he wanted to take their photo. He would sometimes offer them modeling contracts on the spot, anything to lure them to his vehicle. On March 18, 1984, Wilder led 21-year-old Teresa Ann Wait Ferguson, a.k.a. Terry, away from the Merritt Square Mall in Merritt Island, Florida. He raped and murdered her and dumped her body at Canaveral Groves, where it was discovered on March 23rd. Wilder's next victim on March 20th was 19-year-old Linda Grover from Florida State University, whom he abducted from the Governor's Square Mall in Tallahassee, Florida. She had declined his offer to photograph her for a modeling agency, after which he assaulted her in the mall parking lot. Wilder tied Grover's hands, wrapped her in a blanket, and put her in the trunk of his car and drove her to Bainbridge, Georgia. Grover was taken to Glen Oaks Motel and was raped. Wilder blinded her with a blow dryer and super glue. He applied copper wires to her feet and passed an electric current through them. When she tried to get away, he beat her, but she escaped and locked herself in the bathroom, where he began pounding on the walls. Wilder fled in his car, taking all of Grover's belongings with him. Wilder went on to kidnap and murder more women across the country before he was caught and took his own life. The M.O. was all the same and matched what police believe happened to Mary Opitz and Mary Hare in Fort Myers, Florida. Well, he he definitely fits 
the bill on this one. Yeah. I mean, he definitely would be he there. He definitely does. And all that aside, it just – what a monster. And I would hate to think that the two Marys suffered that fate with that monster. But no. there is someone who we have discussed before. Yes. I mean, one more viable suspect, Oba Chandler. Now, Chandler was convicted in 1994 of killing 36-year-old Joan Rogers and her daughters, Christy and Michelle, who were 14 and 17, and dumped their bodies in Tampa Bay. We covered this case. Yeah, Paradise After Dark did an entire episode about this a couple years ago. Yeah, the three women were on their first vacation, making their way home to their small farming community of Wilshire, Ohio, after their Florida trip when they met Chandler. Now, he offered to take them out on his boat to watch the sunset. An offer they were happy to accept. I mean, you're in Florida. A boat, sunset, perfect. But when he got them on the boat and out into the gulf, he tied them all up, raped each one of them, and threw them overboard alive with concrete blocks tied to ropes around their necks. Oh, my God. That was so horrifying. That was a a horrifying case to cover. I I remember it specifically. Now, despite the concrete blocks, obviously the bodies floated to the surface. They were found days later. And sadly, they were naked from the waist down. So you can only imagine how horrible this scene was when investigators showed up and found them there, which right. if you go find the case, it's there on our, on our list. So now following Oba Chandler's conviction, he was incarcerated at the Union Correctional Institution. Now during his 17 years of incarceration until he was executed, he did not have a single visitor the entire time he was in prison. And Chandler was executed. On November 15th in 2011. Now, after his execution, on February 25th, 2014, investigators revealed that DNA evidence identified Chandler as the murderer of 20-year-old Ivelisse Berrios Bugurius, who was raped and strangled in Coral Springs, Florida on November 26th of 1990. Cold case solved. Bugurius had been reported missing on November 26th of 1990 by her husband after not returning home from work at the Sawgrass Mills Mall in Sunrise. Her vehicle was found in the Sawgrass Mills Mall's parking lot with two of the tires slashed. Again, here we are, Lauren, a mall parking lot. So sometimes when you see similarities in in locations, you see similarities in abductions and things. You see similarities in names, faces, descriptions. You have to put those pieces together. Right. Yeah. Well, both of these suspects are long dead now. And to our knowledge, there was no DNA found on Mary Hare's body because it was too badly decomposed. And unfortunately, if Mary Opitz was found now, that would probably be the case with her as well. So will we ever know what happened to the two Marys in Fort Myers, Florida during the winter of 1981? Well, we would really love to figure that out. But one of the things that I find to be amazing is Laura and I, we, we've talked about this case. We've discussed it. We're doing research on it. And we stop at a rest area. We stop at a rest area. And as we walk into the rest area, we go to the restroom. And sitting there on these boards is five or six missing people posters. Yep. And one of these missing people posters is, is Mary, Mary Opitz. Mary Opitz, yeah. That oh, I just got goosebumps. It was that, amazing, and it's like that you know literally what? just happened. I want to say four or five days ago. It was amazing, and it, you know the thing is, is when we switch our format, we want to cover missing and unsolved, and a lot of this is because it, it's great to sit and talk about things that have happened and the convictions. And I love those stories and I love listening to documentaries or watching shows, but to put something out there that hasn't been heard of, I mean, the, and we, we, I had a great conversation with him at CrimeCon, but the only other podcast I can find that's covered this case is Trace Evidence, Steve Pacheco. Yeah. I mean, he's the only person that's covered this case that I can find and I've looked for documentaries and it's, it's like, there's nothing out there. So when Lauren comes to me with this case, I'm like stoked. I'm like happy that she she's and digging then, deep. And then we see the the missing person flyer at a rest stop in the middle of Alligator Alley. It's like our friend, our our favorite folklorist, Chris Balzano, always says, "Follow the signs." Exactly. It's you know maybe this is, will reach the right 
ear balls. Yeah. And maybe somebody out there knows something. I mean, maybe somebody confessed. Maybe there was a deathbed confession. Maybe, you know, somebody knows something. And if you know something, you need to say something. Exactly. And that's one of the things that we want to just kind of put out there is as we progress into this missing and unsolved, ask somebody, hey, hey, you were around at the mall in the 80s. Did, do you remember going to Edison Mall? Did you ever hear this story? Because you don't know what that person knows. They might tell you a story and say, yeah, I heard – that case, it was this guy or, you know, I remember a friend of mine telling me that he knew the guy that did it or whatever. If you hear those things, tell somebody. You can send it, you can tell the investigators, send it to the police, let them investigate. These cold cases are sitting on somebody's desk and people review them regularly. So if you hear something or somebody tells you a story, try to absorb the story, do some research and see if you can kind of lead investigators in a direction or at least drop a tip. Remember the unsolved mysteries? It was all about tips. Yeah. And you got so excited when you saw the update. Update. Just, exactly. You put that out there. So, you know, like Lauren said, if you see something, say something. That's so, right. And if you or someone you know has any information on any of these two crimes regarding Mary Opitz or Mary Hare or any crime for that matter, please contact the Lee County Sheriff's Office at 239 477 one two zero zero. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. Please remember to check out our website for links to all of our social media, our Patreon, our merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And as always, thank you all for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark, dark.